We're live. Hooray. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Beth Gilligan. I'm from the College Corner Theater. And thank you for joining us for tonight's discussion of No Small Matter. Um, before we get started, uh, just thank you, um, in, among other things, the Coolidge is an independent nonprofit organization. Um, your participation in panels, educational classes, streaming of our films like No Small Matter has really helped support us during this time. It is a rough time for the arts um, throughout the country. So we really appreciate your being here with us and, and your support throughout this. Um, we have a great event tonight. We're thrilled to welcome back uh, Lauren Kennedy. She was here, she was at the theater, I shouldn't say she's here. Um, she was at the theater back in January for uh, a live discussion of this film. Um, but you know, this, this current situation has brought up a lot of other issues with it. And then we were able to show it in our virtual screening room. So we thought it was a good time to revisit it. Um, Lauren is the co-founder of Neighborhood Villages and prior to co-founding that, she was director of health policy at the National Partnership for Women and Families in Washington, DC, where she directed the organization's health policy portfolio and oversaw ad advocacy. She's also held senior policy positions at Boston Medical Center, Narrow Pro-Choice America and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation. Um, some of you may recognize Cecilia Matheson from Galoop. Um, she has been a parenting and early childhood expert for over 20 years. Uh, she studied clinical psychology rather in her native Argentina and has a master's in child development from Tufts University. Uh, she worked at the Elliott Pearson Children's School and later as a researcher for the Brazelton Institute at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, in 2006, she joined ISIS Parenting. There may be some of you there like me who remember that. Um, great organization. And in 2014, she opened Galoop, which is now regarded as one of the best programs for young children in the community. And I can personally attest to that being a, a Galoop alum um, with one of my daughters. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of quick uh, event announcements. Neighborhood Villages is going to be presenting a discussion on Monday, July 20th at 7 p.m. If you're interested in this topic, um, they are joining the March Like a Mother for Black Lives for a live conversation with um, U.S. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. And um, the, she'll be joined by several other pa uh, panelists to talk about the need to elevate the voices of black mothers and solve the child care crisis. Um, this is a crisis that has certainly disproportionately affected um, families and people of color. So I, I think that's gonna be a really fascinating discussion. You can find out more about it on their website, which is neighborhoodvillages.org. Um, the Coolidge has another one of these discussions tomorrow. Um, different topic, the great documentary, uh, John Lewis, Good Trouble, that, which is streaming on our virtual screening room service. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, John Lewis, uh, his legacy, his ongoing work. Um, we'll be talking with uh, state rep Nika El Aguardo and Boston Globe columnist, Adrian Walker. Um, so that's also a free YouTube discussion, eight o'clock if you wanna join us, youtube.com slash the Coolidge. Uh, we have an education seminar on Thursday night, as we do every Thursday night, um, on Julie D Dash's film, Daughters of the Dust, um, one of the great independent films by a Black female artist um, from 1992, popularly known as um, the inspiration for Beyonce's Lemonade video. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. So um, info on that is on our website, uh, coolidge.org. So a lot of things going on. Um, but tonight, we'll start by talking about No Small Matter. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Lauren, because um, one of the things that the film really addresses is the opportunity gap. Um, at one point they say a, a child from a higher income family goes into kindergarten almost two years ahead of his or her peers and it only escalates from there. And with COVID, it seems like this has almost gotten, it has really gotten worse, just as the technology gap between families. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing and what, um, you know, how, what the current landscape effectively is. Sure. So I might take one step back and just give um, sort of a, a brief kind of landscape of what the early education and childcare sector looked like before COVID uh, and then right to sort of tee up now how has COVID made it worse. Uh, so what we were working with even in the best of times was a very fragile early education and child care sector with sort of birth to five programs. And that is to say, you know, child care providers, early education providers were operating as small businesses on a, a very kind of 
volatile business model where the revenue coming in was really reliant on children enrolled and parents' ability to pay for it. Um, and even that couldn't cover the cost of the, you know, kind of high quality early education programming that you sought to provide. And so what did that leave us with? It left us with sky high uh, costs of tuition for families that financially locked out a lot of families um, from high quality childcare and early education choices. And it also created a world in which our early educators are severely underpaid, um, not because that's the fault of the employer, but literally because you cannot pass that cost off onto families. And so when COVID hit and all of these um, programs were forced to close for public health reasons, we really just pulled the bottom out of the sector altogether because now you were not having any children enrolled in your program and you completely lost all of the revenue income coming in. And so what that has resulted in is many providers and programs going under completely. They may never reopen. Um, those that are seeking to reopen uh, may have had to lay off or furlough their teaching staff because they were not able to cover salaries. What we also know about the field is that very few providers were able to access federal small business assistance. So they really are in, in dire financial straits. So as we think about how do we build back, we need to build back something stronger that is more uh, affordable and accessible for families so that all children have access to high quality early learning environments. And we also need to build back in a way that props up our ability to deliver on the high quality early learning experience that every child deserves. And that means putting the public resources um, behind these businesses, um, these, you know, sort of providers of education during the most important learning years so that we can pay those educators more and get two things at once. A uh, higher paid uh, workforce that leads to higher quality programming and at the same time making um, these programs more affordable for families. And the only way we do that is through a large collective public investment in the childcare and early learning sector, and really for the first time, um, begin to pay for it like the public good that it is and take it off the backs of families who have never been able <laughs> to afford it. Um, and certainly we need to be um, preventing uh, or closing any opportunity gaps. And because if we don't make that investment now, we're just gonna see them widen. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Um, so how, um, I guess, where are we now with that? Because the, the government obviously has a lot on its plate. There are a lot of, you know, issues to solve regarding COVID. Do you, is there, uh, are, are there things in the works or there actions in the works to, to sort of help push this to the forefront? I know there's a lot of discussion going on about, um, you know, regular elementary schools and high schools and, and at the college level, you know, what kind of discussions are happening at the, at the early education level? Sure. So I think that, you know, the, the good news is that for all of the work that has been done for a long time um, to kind of shout from the rooftops the importance of early education, um, to sort of sound the alarm that we were in the midst of a childcare crisis, the onset of the pandemic has really brought that to the forefront. You can't ignore it anymore. Families right across demographics are feeling the same pain in terms of what does it mean to try to go to work uh, and have you know, children bouncing on the couch behind you. Um, you have employers who are wondering, or maybe for the first time, sort of like putting the, the connection together that it is because families have childcare that they can in fact turn up to work and, and, and do their best uh, on the job. So families engaged, employers engaged in reading about it, right, in newspapers these days, almost every day, every week, there's a new article on this. So that's the good news. However, now what comes next? What is the action that we take to make good on this new conversation we're having about how childcare is essential infrastructure, how our childcare providers and our early educators are essential workers? Um, that's really where the rubber hits the road right now for me and where we need to see um, state and federal government really step up to the plate, as well as employers make an investment um, in the strength of the childcare and early education infrastructure um, so that they are meaningfully providing solutions for their employees and not putting a family in the position of having to choose, do I go to work or do I stay at home with my child? 
Um, so what's happening, you know, in Congress is that there has been a push. We're fortunate here in Massachusetts that our Massachusetts delegation has really been leading uh, on the issue of how to get more federal funds into child care. We have U.S. Congresswoman Catherine Clark and Senator Elizabeth Warren um, to thank for their advocacy to put billions, right, hundreds of billions of dollars into the child care sector. Um, and, you know, should we see those you know, funds released and they'll flow to any given state house or governor's administration, at which case we should all feel very empowered to start calling your state legislators, your state representatives, your state senators and telling them um, that you expect them to appropriate or set aside and prioritize funding for birth to five programs, childcare, early education, the same way um, that they would set aside those funds for K-12. Um, so I think that's really where this moment is right now, is now that we've identified the problem and we know we need a new way forward, is feeling that sense of empowerment, whether you're a parent, whether you're not a parent, are you a provider yourself, are you an educator, um, to really send that email, right, pick up the phone and make a call. And some of that even just starts with telling stories. Um, so, you know, Beth, as you mentioned, uh, I met you and our kids met in uh, Cecilia's Galoot program. And it's in spaces like that, right? Where we begin to tell our stories and realize um, that this isn't an individual problem. This is a collective experience. And so we need to really bring the collective to the forefront, the societal imperative and build something stronger than we had before. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it is a challenge for parents. I thought uh, you guys probably saw um, Deb Perlman's New York Times op-ed. She's, you know, best known for the Smitten Kitchen blog. And she said, where is the parental outrage? And she was like, well, but part of it is parents are so exhausted by the end of the day, juggling this all that they, they haven't been effective advocates. But I think some of the advocacy that can be done is so simple. It is just sending that email or, or making that that phone call and, and the gaps are, are real. I know friends who've gotten notices from daycare centers that weren't working on unlimited capacity because of COVID, we've had to make uh, changes and you need to reserve your spot now. We can't guarantee a spot. Part-time care, which I participated in and was you know, grateful and fortunate to be able to do that. Um, and I think a lot of people do use if they're, they're able to get their kids in three days a week and be with the grandparents two days stay home two days that seems to be completely disappearing because they can only make room for full time so it is it is a really a shifting landscape um i'm wondering cecilia if you can talk a little bit about um how you've adapted because you're you have a wonderful it, wonderful space in chestnut hill it's, it's beautiful it's got every toy and art activity um and you've had to make the shift to the virtual space can you talk about that transition, how it's gone, how, you know. Um. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to. So it was a shock at the beginning, like for all of us, uh, because I was so used to the interpersonal interactions and seeing the kids and seeing the caregivers and talking with them. But um, I did not want to lose that connection with our Gallup community. And so quickly we stepped up to the plate at technology, learn and see what we can do. And what I realized that actually has been very nice is that the kids, even these little kids, so Gallup children are, you know, one, two, three year old. So they are very, very young. They really were, were still craving continuity, familiarity, routine, things that they know, things that they could predict. So at Gallup in person, we used to do a circle time. We used to see, they used to see the same kids and families every time they came to Gallup. And so I started doing circle time in Zoom with all of the kids there. And I sang the same songs and with the same props and with the same books that we were reading and, you know, purposely so. So they could have something familiar all of a sudden when things had changed. So I try to bring familiarity for them in the screen and interpersonal connection. So naming their names and pointing to the things that they are doing and having them showing the toys or the little props that we sing in circle time and seeing I see so and so putting the froggy on her head and so and so is sleeping like a bunny like you know all of that interpersonal connection I think may, makes a big difference for the kids. Um, and other things we put in place, we created um, some materials for the kids to bring home. 
And some of those were for circle time. So each of them have a little froggy, a little duck, a little scarf to go up and down. So each of them have the same things. And so, you know, they all see each other doing the same things and it feels good. It feels good in the mind of a little child. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that as much as I could, I could provide support for the families at home, which they were, as you mentioned before, juggling work, no school and all of these change. And so we created a curriculum for home and I sent suggestions of how you could organize your morning and the rest of your day with your young kids. We know that young children thrive in routines and predictability. They feel comfortable when that's the case. And so they can do better, they can behave better, they can learn better, they can play better. So I suggested um, a routine to keep at home and I gave some activities, enrichment activities that they could do. And so, and I was doing the same activities at home and doing things. And then during circle time at the beginning, we did a little show and tell and we showed each other the activities and, oh, this is my dinosaur habitat. And this is my dinosaur habitat. And, you know, all those kind of things. Um, so helping, um, giving parents something to hold on to say like, what do I do with my day? Like, how do I organize my morning? Um, so th that was another key aspect of it as well. Yeah, no, and I think that that's terrific because when I, I remember just personally when this thing first hit, feeling completely at sea, you know, the schools hadn't figured out, you, you know, even when my older daughter hadn't really figured out distance learning yet and feeling like there were all these resources out there. So to have kind of a more curated sense. And I think that's also, it's comforting because I think, um, I don't know any parents whose kids screen time has decreased during this pandemic. And I think there's, there's a lot of nervousness about that, but I think knowing that you can leverage screens in a meaningful and interactive way and that, that kids thrive from that, that's it, it, Were you surprised by that? And it, how? I was, and it does make a difference, right? So I've talked to so many parents who've been reaching out to me, but they're watching too much screen or is this is bad for them and they're not socializing with their friends and is this is bad, but of course, like um, we all have those worries and this was, is such an unprecedented situation, right? This is completely new to all of us. But I did notice that the interactive screen time is a different type of screen time as opposed to a more passive viewing. Um, so the interactive generates connection, generates familiarity, um, it, it encourages still it, it peer interactions and social emotional skills. They are saying hello to me, they're saying goodbye, they're saying hello to their friends, they're asking what is that, you know, they are like interacting as much as we can over the screen. Um, so it is a different type of quality of screen time. Um, the, the more passive one, which all of us probably had to do is in this pandemic, <laughs> none of us are exempt from it. It's, you know, I always tell parents don't feel guilty about it, it's okay as long as we balance it. And if we find, you know, good quality programming like PBS or, you know, it shows like that that are educational, that they are nice. If we know as parents what our kids are watching, even if it's a little bit more of a passive programming, then we can talk with them about what they're watching. We can ask them about it. We can interact about it. Do you notice this? Do you notice so-and-so? Were they mad at each other? Were they taking turns and things like that? So even the more passive one, we can still make it more interactive if we are knowledgeable about it. We can, if we have the time, we can sit with them and watch it, but we don't always have the time and all grown-ups and all of us need a break or go cook or take a shower. So it's okay. But if we know what our kids are watching, we can still interact about it with them. Yeah, no, that is good to know. And I think, um, 
you know, it, there's a moment in the film where they, somebody says social interaction is like brain food for children. And, you know, there, there was a, I saw in the Wall Street Journal the other day, a headline pediatricians and psychologists are raising alarms about the potential impact of pro prolonged social isolation on children. Is, it, is Zoom a good kind of workaround, like for pe parents to do sort of FaceTime things or, or, or the circle time in Galoop? Does, have you found that that sort of helped with very young children? Because they're not getting that sort of... They are not yeah. now, right? It's more difficult. I do find it helps. Um, you know, it's very difficult to replace. Well, I'm not talking about replacing. We don't want to replace two so social interactions with peers and with other adults, which is so important for learning to be friends with somebody, to cooperate, to take turns, to share, and all of these skills that are very important that our little kids are learning. But I, I also think that in the situation that we are at right now, we cannot cut our kids out of any sort of interaction just because they cannot do it in person. Mm -hmm. So I think a video chat or a Zoom chat or FaceTime with family members, obviously with grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, I think is worth doing. And I still think that even little kids can practice skills. So we need to see what, you know, what their level, uh, the level they are at. Some of them are gonna be able to carry conversations. Some of them not so much. They're just gonna be showing you a toy or something that they made and they just offer it to you. They do that all the time in circle time. They go here, <laughs> look. And so I make comments on it. And, you know, I ask some questions. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't, but that's okay. They are, you know, they are still very young. They're getting all this interaction. Um, so I do think that is worth doing that. Um, another idea for parents who I know we, we all worry about that they are not interacting with other children as much, but another idea is reading books that show a lot of skills that kids are learning at this age. Um, I love the, uh, I know you guys know them because I read them at Gallup all the time, but I love the Piggy and Elephant books. They talk so much about different emotions, right? So there is a book called, you know, I love my new toy. And then another one is, should I share my ice cream? And another one, I'm invited to a party. So, you know, they have all these different topics that are, you know, learning social interactions, uh, uh, environments and, and situations. So I think reading to reading these books and talking about it is a good thing that parents can do when kids cannot see, I mean, always, but still, even now that kids cannot see other kids so much. Um, and, um, and also model, right? As a grown up and as a parent model about, can I have a turn? Can you share this? I'm sharing this with you and, you know, just model and behave in a way that we want our kids to learn to behave around others. And I think that also goes a long way. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad when you, when you see, don't see your child playing with other children, but there are things we can do and we need to keep thinking, I know this is taking a long time, longer than any of us wished, but it is temporary. It's not gonna be forever and ever and ever. Um, and talking to them about their friends, naming their friends, remembering situations. And if the weather is nice and you guys can meet outside for a play date outdoors, I think it's still very much worth doing. Um, yes, and these are the little tricks that will take us all the way until life can go back to normal. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. I forgot to add, if, if people watching on YouTube have questions, feel free to submit them. Um, I did want to go back to, because um, the film talks a lot about uh, high quality childcare and Lauren, I know you mentioned that earlier. I'm curious as to how, how, how do you both define that? And you know, how, what are ways in which we can achieve that uh, nationally? Um, do you, do you both, I mean, Cecilia, I think you're kind of modeling it in a way. Um, I can, I mean, I can speak to it a little bit and Lauren, you can jump in. Um, you know, for high quality early childhood care and education, one of the most important things I believe is the 
quality of the teachers, the way the teachers interact with the young children, with the babies, toddlers, and preschoolers. So these interactions, we want them to be nurturing. We want them to be in a caring environment. Uh, we want children to feel uh, heard and to feel validated and to feel, you know, we want teachers to talk to children in a respectful manner, the same way that you would talk to adults and really hear to what they are, they have to say, even when it doesn't make much sense. I know maybe even, I think most of you, both of you guys, I think have been to my positive discipline workshop, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'm a big believer in positive discipline and positive interactions with the children and make them feel heard and valued. Um, so um, for, you know, for that, we need to have a good ratio, right? So then teachers can really pay attention to a, a certain number of kids. And we need teachers who are loving and who are well-trained in early childhood and understand that there is so much brain development happening like we saw in, in the film. And, and this is like the, you know, the architecture is we are building it as we interact with them, right? Um, and so, you know, having guidance for the teachers about having um, positive interactions with the kids and naming emotions and helping them learn these executive functioning skills that the film also talks about for them to be able to cooperate, to make decisions, to plan and, um, to negotiate and you know all all these kind of skills are happening in early childhood every moment really every day um yeah so those are some of the things that make early education high quality yeah and certainly hiring high quality teachers costs money lauren can you uh, yeah so so that was you know sort of what i was thinking of adding is that's the environment that every child deserves. That's the environment um, that will help prevent the education gap, right? That then we then, you know, try so hard to, to narrow once it's already in place, let's prevent it altogether. Um, let's ensure that as many children as possible, all children are kindergarten ready. These are the programs we need. And we have all of the academic research, right, in the world telling us that this is the best investment we can make. So what should that investment in that space look like? And as um, Cecilia was saying, right, the bedrock of a quality education program is the teachers. We understand that in K-12. We understand it in birth to five, but the difference is that in birth to five, we provide no resources um, to support the teacher the way that the teacher deserves to be supported. And that's from sort of the beginning. Okay, I want to launch a career in early education and care. What does it require? Um, in the you know sort of baseline, it requires a credential. Now, how much does it cost to get that credential? Um, well, if I'm working in early education and care right now, chances are I'm being paid minimum wage. So I probably can't afford getting that credential that may be costing me $2,000 to make it through that course. So sort of step one is, well, how can we reduce some of the barriers to entering the field? And, and Massachusetts has made a great investment in actually creating programs where you can now get your credential um, at a community college for free to make an investment in building up the pipeline of talent looking to go into early education and care. And so now you're in early education and care. And we know that even at present, um, if salaries are depressed because we have the faulty infrastructure that we do, people still want to be early educators because they feel passionate about the work. So once we're, you're in the field, what are the things that we need to do to demonstrate that you are just as valuable as a third grade teacher? And that's where sometimes, right, this conversation gets lost. To demonstrate your value, we need first to pay you commensurate with, with that value, commensurate with what we would invest um, were this uh, a part of our public education system. Um, so, so what are the policy changes that we need to make to put more public resources into early education and care so that we can raise our educator salaries, recruit our best talent and then keep it. In no small matter, right, one of those sort of heartbreaking moments is they're profiling this incredible teacher. And at a certain point in the film, you see that she has to have a second job 
um, to support cost of living. So her passion is the classroom. But on top of that, she has to have a second job in order to make ends meet. That should not be how we're treating um, our, our valuable early educators. So we need to help you get into the field. We need to pay you. And then we also need to invest in your ongoing professional development, um, both again, to demonstrate that this is um, a profession and we want to continue to build your strength, um, but also because then that in and it itself contributes to ongoing quality improvement so that it's the strength of the educator underpinning the strength of the program um, and creating that nurturing, loving, educational environment that is so critical um, from infancy through toddlerhood into preschool, pre-K and on to kindergarten. Yeah, that's great. And so I want to, um, I wanted to ask about the, um, oh, well, here's a really, we have a few questions. I, I was going to ask about that. I thought the military stuff in the film was really interesting and very surprising to me, the degree to which the military is, is invested in this and they see it as, you know, a national security issue. Um, but just, uh, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but I think dovetailing on um, the point that Lauren just made, uh, we have a question um, from Holly G about what can childcare provider providers slash centers do to prevent teacher burnout, even effective early education programs suffer from high teacher turnover. Um, do you guys have insights in, into that? Because that is, I mean, it is a challenging job for sure. Um, so I can give maybe some kind of context and then Cecilia, I'll leave it to you and, and, and your personal experiences as an educator to, to understand what it's like to actually be in the field. Um, but some of the context for that, right, is this is a highly demanding job. I am a mom of a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old. And what COVID has taught me very quickly is that no one should ever ever, ever hire me as a preschool teacher because I do not have it what it takes. <laughs> to, to make it, right? Um, so we need to recognize that this is a very demanding field that, that is, um, the folks in it have a gift. They have a special skill set. And so if you say, please give us this amount of energy and emotion and we're only going to pay you $10 an hour, how long will that carry over if you have that as your, you know, say main job, but then you go to a second job afterwards? How long can you sustain that? How long can you sustain the, the income? It may be a position that you can be in at a certain life point, but then maybe you have um, something change in your life circumstances and all of a sudden, you know, $27,000, $30,000 a year isn't going to cut it anymore and you need to move into a higher paying field. We shouldn't be having that happen and we can solve that problem. Um, but again, it's going to take public investment to solve that problem um, because we can't pass the cost off onto the family paying you know, paying tuition for their child to go to childcare, the math just doesn't work. Um, so the other sort of thing I'll mention too, in light of COVID, a, a, a need constantly articulated by the field right now is in addition to support to reopen our programs, um, in addition to needing help to, to, to support our, our teachers, pay our teachers, stay afloat, is we need resources to offer our teachers mental health supports. Um, because this has always been a demanding work environment. And now there's an added layer of stress because of what it might um, you know, take for you to feel empowered to go to work every day in a, in a pandemic setting. Um, we know that right, children are, are going through an incredibly stressful time themselves. Um, so what you may be um, you know, exposed to every day within the context of the classroom. Um, so in order to really make sure that we're, we're supporting our teachers in this moment, likely requires even more investment in our early education workforce um, so that we don't lose them to burnout at a time when we need them most. Yeah. And Cecilia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I agree with everything Lauren said. And, you know, it just makes me think it is true that being an early childhood teacher is one of the hardest jobs that they are there. It's like Lauren mentioned, people do it, the teachers do it because they truly love it. They, they, their passion is in it. We cl Clearly, they are not doing it for the money. We know these uh, now, um, 
But um, it is hard work, no matter how passionate you is. I mean, you are, you are both parents. I'm a mom too. No matter how much passionate and how, how much we love our children, it's very hard work to be taking care of little children, to educate little children, to have the patience, to have the emotional, you know, strength or all the times and, and do it. And so... Well, you guys know a little bit about Galoop. So when I, you know, when I thought about Galoop, and it, for those of you who don't know about it, it's a program for young children and caregivers. And I'm the, the main teacher, but my background is child development and parenting, right? And one of the goals of the program, besides offering uh, a wonderful environment for the young children is offering support for caregivers and it's you know caregivers parents and nannies but in this case teachers who are taking care of these children sometimes you know for a very long day they need support they need to run ideas by it they need training they need to um somebody understand what they are going through, somebody who gives them skills about how to handle certain situations that are tricky. And so um, I would say that that would be another piece that for teachers not to burn out, like the question would be is like, there has to be a support system in place um, for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, we have another question that said um, from Jennifer. Um, and, and she says, are there opportunities now to make high quality online curriculum for all ages accessible? Um, and I guess I think she's sort of talking to what you were saying, Cecilia, about um, the things you're doing. Um, yes. So I don't know about how many opportunities are there. I, I do think that we have learned in the last few months about how to make uh, an online curriculum more um, effective and you know uh, creative and engaging and all of that. But um, I, it's 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 hard to know right now if if it is at a high level in every single school and situation and for every single age. I, I don't know about that. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think I think there are a lot of um, variables, and there's, the, I mean, one of the silver linings, I guess, of COVID is a lot of these discussions are coming to the forefront, and I think um, certainly teacher uh, early education teacher compensation is a parent. I was unaware of it quite honestly until we had a babysitter who had worked for the daycare center, where which was a very nice high end, you know. Brookline kind of place. Um, she uh, babysat and she, she revealed that she had been earning minimum wage. And that was shocking to me. I think a lot of parents didn't know that. So I think the fact that the awareness of that is building of, you know, inequality of these, these gaps. Um, I guess we can go quickly before we sort of wrap, um, talk a little bit about the military thing, because they, they do seem to have a, a system down. They do seem to really value it. Um, is there anything in there that could be a template, do you think, Lauren, for a broader you know, national plan to, to prioritize and, and, and just make accessible or, you know, early childhood care. I mean, definitely. I think for all the, um, all the, the downer things I usually have to say about, you know, childcare and crisis in, in America today, that this is the bright light at the end of the tunnel is that one, we, I mean, we know we can do better. And we know that we can make any public good available to any child in this country because that's what we we do in K-12, right? Why, um, you know, why unfortunately we, we don't have an early education kind of curriculum available to all is because we don't have an early education infrastructure in this country or in this state really, right? So there was no vehicle. Um, to put forward something like that, the way that in K-12, um, you know, we know there's, there's problems with how it executes, but at least there was sort of one central place to make sure that every child in Massachusetts could access um, a, a, an online learning experience. So what does military offer us? It offers us a blueprint for what the future could look like. What military did um, was take a look at sort of the landscape of the United States Armed Forces and say, hmm, a couple things have changed. We've seen diversification in 
our men and women in uniform. We have more women now who are um, in the armed forces. And so what does that mean for their childcare needs, right? One could apply that to labor force participation generally <laughs> and, um, and the added, you know, sort of burden that women often face around caregiving and, and being in the workplace. Um, they also looked at it from, you know, the, the readiness to deploy whether you are a father in uniform or a mother in uniform, you are ready to deploy if you know that your family back home is taken care of. And that's what participation in US military childcare um, affords you, is you know that your young child is in a high quality learning environment so that when you're overseas, you're not worried about that. Um, they also look at it as uh, a multi-generation investment. Military families are often um, multiple generations deep. So the investment that you make, not just in your, your current um, you know, parent in uniform, you're also making an investment in potentially that next generation of men and women looking to, to sign up um, for service um, because you ensure that they were in early learning programs when they were very young. So what does military childcare do? Um, it looked at the two key pillars of what equity in this space would be. It would be affordability for parents and it would be identifying the true cost of delivering a high quality program that paid its teachers um, better than just minimum wage and say, we're gonna do both. We're gonna invest in affordability um, by using a sliding scale fee schedule that's tied to household income so that no family um, is paying more than I, I think it works out to roughly 7% of household income. It's universal eligibility to participate. So you have the kids of, you know, four-star generals in with the kids of someone who just enlisted yesterday and everybody is paying, right, based on affordability as tied to household income. So that's affordability. Now, the second is how do we make sure that those children, those families are in high quality programs? Um, well, military said, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it right. And built the equation upon, if this is the four star, five star program we wanna see, then we're gonna invest the resources that ensure the providers um, are able to deliver on that. And so how do you get, you know, sort of an increased price, right? Increased quality is gonna raise the, the cost of delivering care but reducing the cost of entry to the family, there's only one answer and that's to fill that gap with public subsidies. And that's what military childcare did. The Department of Defense made the commitment um, to say that we will provide the subsidy that allows this both to be high quality and affordable. And so now a program that was stood up you know, in the 90s uh, is now really, I think our best blueprint for what we could um, adopt across the country. Obviously, it takes you know translating different play, uh, different elements of it, um, but really create something that preserves our mixed delivery model. Right? We want to preserve parent choice. Um, do you want to go to a center? Do you want to go to a family in home? Do you want part time? Do you want full time? Um, but create an infrastructure around it that says, you know, to to sort of play in this sandbox you have to abide by this sliding scale tuition fee. You have to then also commit to being accredited. You have to commit to paying your educators a certain amount. And in order to make sure that we um, set you the provider up for success, we're gonna ensure that you have the resources that you need to reach that, that bar. And that's what's missing in the childcare infrastructure generally right now is we have not made that public commitment of dollars. So we ask providers to deliver an exceptional product and give them none of the resources that would allow them to do so, um, right, without having to just skate by on razor thin margins. So I think military childcare stands as this important example of making a collective investment in what is a public good. And it also offers, and I, I appreciate this a lot, the sort of homegrown blueprint that you don't have to look to Norway, you know, you don't have to look to, to Denmark um, and try to figure out how you're gonna kind of fit a, a European model into the American psyche that we could say, actually, we've done it here. Um, and we know it works because we, we grew it here at home. And so now it's time to take what we've done in the military and apply it to the entire country. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> well, I think I, that's a good place to leave it. Uh, we had spoken earlier about just advocacy. Um, I know neighborhood villages, um, 
you have an e-newsletter I got the other day. And, um, that's the a first good, one. <laughs> very exciting. So uh, if anyone wants to sign up for that, get a, I, I'm assuming advocacy alerts will be coming to follow the issue because it is going to be, hopefully it will trickle down to the state level and we'll have the, the chance to, to call our local reps and, and, you know, Massachusetts was a leader in healthcare. It's been a leader many times um, and hopefully we can be a leader on this issue because COVID has certainly exposed the, the cracks in the system and many systems, but, you know, certainly in the system. Um, and we're just so grateful for dedicated teachers like Cecilia who are out there keeping our kids engaged, helping keep us sane, giving us advice and everything. Um, so thank you both for all the, the tremendous work that you're, you're doing and thank you for being a part of tonight's event. Um, again, if, if, uh, if you want to tell your friends about this conversation, it has been recording. It'll be on our YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash the Coolidge. Anyone who couldn't catch it live um, can check it out there, but um, have a good evening and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've ended the stream. <laughs>